Well, thank you, Michael. Um, that introduction was one of the more unusual that, <laughs> that I've had in my nearly seven years in this job. Um, but uh, my dear wife is here, and uh, yeah, it is 30 years in November, as I, a friend of mine once said, after he'd been married for 10 years, he applied for long service leave. <laughs> and, uh, but I haven't ever done that, <laughs> nor will I. Um, <clears throat> Anyhow, thanks, thanks for uh, the invitation to be here. <clears throat> Perhaps for John Tuckerman, the shock of that union was what uh, pushed him into stockbroking. I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, it's a great pleasure to be here in Brisbane again. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks for coming along. And as you may know, the Reserve Bank Board, in fact, held this meeting here in Brisbane yesterday at which we deliberated for a very long time and then elected to sit with the cash rate unchanged. Um, I don't propose to comment in any detail about that particular decision because, as you know, we released a, <coughs> a statement um, afterwards and you'll have the minutes in a couple of weeks' time. What I do want to do is to step back a little bit from that and look at the broader picture. Firstly, by looking back a little bit over a period of time and then um, looking forward and contemplating some aspects of the challenges that we face. The economy grew at uh, about its trend pace through 2012, but more of that growth was in the first half of the year than the second. Uh, and so it slowed a little in the second half. Over the last three quarters, for which we have data, it would appear that uh, real GDP is growing at an annualised pace of about 2.5%. Our guess is that sub-trend growth is still happening now and is probably going to continue um, <coughs> at that sub-trend pace uh, for a little while yet. The thing that accompanies that is that the unemployment rates tended to drift up a little. Uh, employment is growing. Indeed, the number of jobs in the economy is at an all-time high. But it isn't growing quite as quickly as the supply of labour, <coughs> and so uh, unemployment has gone up a bit. <coughs> Pardon me. Thinking back over the past five years, since the period just prior to the eruption of the, the crisis, or, or its worsening anyway, after Lehman, our economy has expanded by about 13%. The corresponding figure for the US is 3%, and for Japan or the UK or the Euro area, that calculation still has a negative sign before the number, so their economies are still smaller than they were five years ago. Some of our Asian trading partners and neighbours have done fairly well also. Uh, Korea's growth is about the same as ours. Singapore, a little faster, 18%. And of course, the real standout Despite um, frequent uh, agonising over the Chinese uh, economic story, China's GDP is 50, 5 0% bigger today than it was five years ago. Their growth rate is, has moderated from 10% plus for a number of years to now um, about 7.5%. That's what the Chinese authorities have uh, indicated they want to achieve. They seem to be achieving it. Most of the data we're getting from China are consistent with that. <coughs> it's worth noting that while Australia has done relatively well, if you, if you look at other advanced countries, um, <coughs> the average growth rate over that five years is about 2.5%. For the 10 years up to five years ago, the average growth rate was 3.5%. So we've slowed down. Of course, in that preceding decade, uh, we were using up spare capacity in the economy. Unemployment kept declining. Um, and uh, that was the nature of that, that phase. Uh, today, of course, unemployment is a little higher than it was five years ago. They're still quite low by international... By, um, historical standards. Well, there's a couple of points to make about this 
lower pace of average growth in the past five years. The first is that um, we were overheating by the end of 2007 or early 2008. Capacity was stretched because the resource sector was in mining boom mark one. It was well and truly underway. But at that stage, household spending was still growing briskly. Uh, credit growth was still in double digits and so on. So inflation picked up and in fact it got to 5%. Um, that was substantially due to, to domestic pressures, not just international ones, though those weren't helping. So they were all clear signs that we weren't going to be able to keep growing at that earlier pace. Um, <clears throat> we made that point many times. It was a very unpopular point to make, actually. But uh, that was the fact. Well, inflation did subsequently abate, as we know, but that experience showed that if there was going to be a very large pickup in resource activity, uh, other sectors were not going to be able to continue on the track that they had been on. The second observation <coughs> is that similar declines in rates of growth have been seen among other countries, even the ones who negotiated the crisis successfully. In our region, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, New Zealand, Malaysia, all these countries have seen average growth post-2008 slower than prior to then, uh, in some cases by more than two percentage points. So we seem to be part of a broader pattern there. Uh, it's true that we've benefited a lot from China, but so have many of those other countries. And the fact that no other country seems to have managed to return to the pre-crisis rates of growth I think is highly suggestive that some of that growth was being driven by forces that weren't going to be sustainable. And maybe that's a conditioning factor that we need to think about uh, when we contemplate our own growth aspirations and particularly the way we might seek to achieve those aspirations. At this point, uh, we have unemployment at 5.5%. It is tending to rise, but five and a half is quite a low number historically. Inflation is in the twos, which is right where we want it. The banks are strong, <coughs> government finances overall remain quite sound. Uh, growth is a bit soft, inflation is low, and so that combination means we should have accommodative monetary policy. We certainly have um, low interest rates, the lowest for 50 years, in fact. Um, so that's appropriate. We have significant structural change occurring. That is always challenging and difficult. <clears throat> but set in context, I think um, the macroeconomic data over the past few years are quite respectable. And really, anybody who's got a memory of the 70s or the 80s or the 90s who's honest, I think, would recognise them as good outcomes. It's been said that we've been lucky to have the China boom and, and the resource investment boom, otherwise we would have had weaker growth. And that's true as a piece of arithmetic. As a piece of analysis, it's not wrong, but it's not complete. <clears throat> I think you could equally say that we were lucky that the effects of the global downturn five years ago helped to in the process of bringing down Australia's inflation rate, which was way too high at that time to something acceptable. You could also say, I think, that we were lucky that the American subprime crisis erupted then and not later. And the reason I say that is we did have some subprime lending in Australia, not very much. It was a small share of the market, but it was growing very quickly. Five more years of that and we would have had a much bigger vulnerability. So the fact that things went wrong in, in the US when they did meant that a problem that in Australia was then small indeed stayed small. <clears throat> I think you could also say that we were lucky that the change in the behaviour of households, slower borrowing, more saving and so on, came along when it did. Had they continued as they were, uh, they would have become much more financially extended, and I think it's obvious now, isn't it, that that would have been very risky. <clears throat>
Moreover, the change in behaviour of households in terms of saving, as I'll say shortly, has helped the economy absorb a one in a century resource investment boom without overheating. <clears throat> So, yes, we were lucky to have China. We had some other bits of luck, um, and to some extent we, we made our own luck. Of course, the story isn't over. We now face the phase of the resource boom where the investment is peaking and will decline over the years ahead. And that appears to pose significant challenges. So how will we meet those? Well, I think the first thing to say is that a good starting point is very important. And we have a better starting point going into this episode than we might have had, and certainly better than we've had on other occasions like this in the past. If we'd followed the <coughs> pattern of previous commodity price booms, we would have seen much more inflation, much more credit growth, more asset price inflation, and more excesses generally. And then, when the terms of trade turned down, as they always do, we would have been much more likely to have a deep slump. And indeed, when you look through the history of these episodes, as we've done through Australia's history, um, that's usually the pattern. The early 50s, the mid 70s, the late 70s, and even if you go back to uh, the 1890s, uh, in each case, domestic excesses arose resulting from the flow-ons from high commodity prices or, or other things which drove high levels of optimism combined with a fixed exchange rate and other policy weaknesses and those things then made the ensuing downturn much worse. It hasn't been that way this time. This time the resource boom, which is unequivocally bigger than anything we've seen for a hundred years at least, has been accommodated without a big rise in inflation or a big run-up in leverage or an unsustainable asset boom or many of the other excesses we might get <coughs> or we might have gotten. In fact, for most of the past several years, we've had various regions and industries complaining that they haven't benefited from the, the mining boom. There were actually spillovers, but we certainly have not had the kind of excesses that have accompanied other events of this nature. Well, one very big reason for that, of course, is we've had something going on this time that we didn't have on other occasions, and that's a floating exchange rate. We've had outstanding monetary policy, of course, but we've had uh, a floating exchange rate. <coughs> and that price, a very key price, played the role it's supposed to play when the economy receives a very large, very expansionary external shock, that is, it went up. It's been noted by other commentators quite correctly that the real effective exchange rate, which is the one that matters, so that's not just the dollar rate, but the effective rate across currencies and in uh, real terms uh, uh, correcting for price level differentials. <coughs> the real exchange rate has been as high or, or at its highest in the past year or so until recently anyway, uh, since the float. Indeed, if you go back 100 years, there are very few periods where the exchange rate in real effective terms has been higher than it's been lately. And in the written version of the talk, there's, there's a chart that shows that. Now, at one level, for it to be very high is not very surprising in the sense that the terms of trade rise and the associated resource investment pick up themselves were easily the biggest thing for a hundred years. So it's not surprising the exchange rate went up a lot. Actually it might have gone up more, I think, but for the changes in behaviour by households in particular, who have not returned to their earlier spending habits and instead have maintained a saving rate much more in line with historical norms if you look back through history. Corporations likewise have tended to be reasonably conservative. They put a lot of emphasis on reducing debt, on high levels of liquidity and cash and so on. Had these entities not done that, had they behaved in the earlier fashion, then <clears throat> I think other things equal, we would have had lower national saving, 
a larger gap between saving and investment, that is a larger current account deficit, interest rates would have been higher than they've been, and the exchange rate presumably even higher than it was. Now, in that scenario, some, some business areas, largely in the non-traded sector, like banking or real estate or retail, might have enjoyed <coughs> that period of household gearing up going on a bit longer. Um, but I would conjecture that other sectors, trade exposed ones, would have had an even harder time with an even higher exchange rate than they have in fact had over recent years. Moreover, we would, I think, in that world have been more exposed to the effects of the decline in the terms of trade that, of course, we're now seeing. So the more cautious, or more accurately, more prudent behaviour of households, together with some genuine caution by many firms, has been a force which has helped the economy accommodate a hundred year high in resource investment. In a sense, higher saving by the private sector has helped to fund the resource investment boom at lower interest rates and a lower exchange rate than would otherwise have occurred. I'm not convinced that we should lament that set of outcomes as much as we seem to. That's not to deny <coughs> at all that for many areas of the economy, the exchange rate has been, quote, too high, unquote, given the level of costs and productivity that, <coughs> that are in place. Realistically, though, it's the nature of the shock we experienced, which is a relative price shock, that certain high cost and or low productivity parts of the economy would struggle with the implications of a terms of trade gain. In fact, I think even if the exchange rate hadn't risen, these sectors would have struggled. If you think about it, even if, let's suppose the exchange rate had stayed at 70 cents. <clears throat> but in that world, the resource companies would have had even higher expected profits, even more capacity to bid away labour and capital from other parts of the economy. Inflation of wages and prices would have been higher, and in the scramble to keep up, I think many of the same companies that have had difficulties in recent years would still have had difficulties keeping up in that world. Admittedly, higher general inflation can, for a while, conceal problems because everybody's nominal revenue rises faster, so it's less obvious where the problems are, but that only lasts for a while. In the end, relative prices had shifted, and at any exchange rate, some sectors were going to find that to their advantage and others to their disadvantage. And of course, taking the inflationary route, had we done that, would have left a much bigger legacy of problems to come home to roost uh, over time. Having said all that, uh, the exchange rate was, I think, too high for a period. It's no secret that I, for one, and I think this is obvious from our, the things we've said before, I've been surprised that the foreign exchange market has taken as long as it has to reflect the fact that the terms of trade peaked some time ago, in fact, nearly two years ago. In the end, though, market-based exchange rates do adjust eventually, and they usually do it in a less disruptive way than exchange rates which are artificially held. Um, a flexible exchange rate is an important part of the adjustment process over all phases of the cycle and it remains very much to our advantage that we have one. And I think um, <clears throat> if the exchange rate needs a lower exchange rate, it will probably get it. So I would argue, taking these points, that as we face the undoubted challenges of the decline in resource investment that's now beginning, our starting point, at least, is in several important respects a better one than we've usually had in the past at this particular point of a cycle like this. A starting point is just that, of course, not a guarantee that everything will be fine. It's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient one. And it's understandable as we go into this phase that people were going to ask, well, where will the growth come from? We've had all this growth from mining 
where will it come from now? Actually, it's worth recalling, and, and the conventional discussion um, is indeed asking that question. It's not that long ago people were worried that there weren't any positive spillovers from mining, or maybe the spillovers even were negative and we'd have been better off never to have had the mining boom. We seem now to have gone to a position where, oh, well, there were positive spillovers after all, but they're going to go away, and so we'll have a problem. <coughs> And so it's natural to ask where will the growth come from. That actually is a question which periodically recurs at moments of uncertainty. There's a bit of grey hair here, so some of us are old enough to remember, or no hair in my case, are old enough to remember the aftermath of the early 90s recession. 20 or 21, 22 years ago now, there was almost despairing pessimism about economic prospects. The unemployment rate was 10, reaching 11 per cent. And there were many people who felt that we were destined for double-digit unemployment for a very long time. In fact, as we now know, we were on the cusp of two decades of very good economic performance uh, compared with either our history or the uh, overseas standards. And at the end of that 20 year period, our country's um, reputation, relative standing for economic management has improved out of sight from where it was back then. Who predicted that? Well, uh, not too many people that I can think of. Moreover, areas of the economy that we don't normally think about have proven to be the major drivers of and participants in that growth. In the 21 years from the end of the recession up to the middle of 2012, and that's the last observation where we have the annual data by industry, which are the reliable ones. So over that 21 years, our real GDP has expanded by about 100%, 99% to be exact. Anybody care to guess how many, of, how many percentage points of that 100 came from manufacturing? 15, anyone? Anyone want to guess? The answer is three out of the 100. That's not to denigrate manufacturing at all. The largest contributions came from financial services, 13 points, mining, 10, construction, nine, and professional services in healthcare, both seven or eight points each. The category called other is usually prominent in this calculation as well. And it's, a, it's a usual rule of data that a lot of the actioning, action is happening in other. <laughs> and when you think about it, that you'd expect that because that's the nature of a dynamic evolving economy. New things are happening that we don't read about in the papers and we won't for a few years. And so um, that's quite important. Over that same period, the number of jobs has gone up 50%, and around two thirds of that increase is attributable to household or business services of various kinds. In other words, most of the time, the answer to the question, where will the growth come from, is that only part of it will come from the older established areas that we're used to thinking about. And a fair bit of it will come from new things, some of which we're only dimly aware of. And as I say, that's the nature of a dynamic and evolving economy. That's a structural point, it's not really a cyclical one. Um, and some of the old established areas will still be cyclical, but it's worth keeping in mind, I think, as we go through these next few years. If we look at the current conjuncture in the standard um, economists' uh, expenditure account space, consumption, investment, and so on. There are some key areas which are actually well placed to expand, I think, once they have the confidence to do so. That's the critical thing, and I'll come back to that, the confidence. Business investment outside of mining is actually quite low right now. As a share of GDP, it, it is above its early 90s recession lows, but not much. So many companies, rather than extending themselves, have been quite conservative, as I said earlier in recent years, and they're sitting on quite a lot of cash. It's hard to believe, actually, that that configuration won't change, and won't need to change, in fact, 
at some point over the next few years. Likewise, housing investment has been unusually low for quite a while with households intent on reducing debt and so on. Households, in fact, have accumulated quite a deal of cash. If you look at the community's holdings of monetary assets, it's not, it's not so fashionable to look at monetary aggregates these days, but if you look, holdings of monetary assets are actually rising quite solidly over the past couple of years. So the population, in fact, has quite a bit of, of uh, cash. Meanwhile, population growth is solid. In fact, it's picked up lately. So if anything, we will need to build more dwellings than we have been. Meanwhile, interest rates are low, very low. Dwellings are more affordable and finance approvals for housing purchases have risen, as it turns out, by 16%, not too shabby, over the past year. So there are fundamentals in place for at least some of these other areas of demand to start to move ahead more quickly having been subdued for a few years. Now we have to add two things to that. The first is uh, no one can stand here and pretend to you that, that they can fine tune the handover from mining to other things. Um, we have in fact had a few handovers over recent years if you think about it. There was a handover from private spending to public when the GFC happened. <coughs> There was then subsequently a handover from public spending as a big driver to mining investment uh, a year or two later. And those handovers in fact happened largely successfully. That's not a guarantee that the next one will at all. But it does mean I think that we shouldn't assume that a handover won't occur. But we can't fine tune it. The second thing to say is that a lot depends critically on confidence. Confidence that intangible thing, difficult to measure and certainly very difficult to increase it. Um, we're talking here about the confidence that the future will be good, that innovation's worth trying, that there'll be consumers for products or new products that a risk is worth taking, that kind of confidence. And well, all of you know that it seems right now that that kind of confidence um, is a bit subdued. To the extent that those subdued animal spirits reflect uh, global issues, which, which they must to some extent, well, there's not much we can do about that other than tend to our own uh, national affairs as diligently as possible. More generally, while there are various ways that policy measures can easily damage confidence, there isn't, I don't think, a simple policy lever that you can pull that will suddenly create confidence. Rather, confidence-enhancing conduct of policies really involves, I think, having well-established frameworks and consistently over time acting uh, in accordance with those frameworks. That, I think, is the way to generate a sense of confidence in the community generally and in the business community that we all know where we're going. The Reserve Bank, of course, has a well-established monetary policy framework, inflation targeting, flexible inflation targeting, that we have been pursuing now for more than 20 years. <coughs> Guided by that, we will, I think, be able to continue to do our part, consistent with our mandate, to assist in the transition in sources of demand that the economy needs. We can't fine tune that, and I'm not going to pretend we can, but we will do what can reasonably be done by the central bank. The conduct of other policies, likewise, needs to be principled and consistent. Notwithstanding the difficulties of achieving a budget surplus in any particular year, and that's always going to be hostage to what happens in the economy that year, the vagaries of forecasting and so on, there remains a strong commitment to fiscal responsibility in Australia across both sides of politics, even if they differ on how they might achieve that uh, sustainability. I think the importance of that commitment in future is likely to be heightened, if anything, given that significant challenges will arise over the medium term 
in funding government, government initiatives that the community appears to want. Consistency in other areas that have a bearing on cost and productivity is also important. My sense is that at the enterprise level, efforts to improve productivity and lower costs have been stepped up a great deal under the pressure of the high exchange rate, structural change and so on. But we might still be asking, I think, I think we should still be asking, whether there are things in the way of faster improvement there. Is the combination of regulatory structures of various kinds, however well-meaning and valid they might be in their own terms, imposing unnecessary and excessive costs of compliance or creating undue complexity for business? I think that's an important question. Uh, I can't really say much more about that other than to note that at a previous presentation in Queensland, not to the Economic Society but to um, a uh, economic summit that the former Prime Minister held, I made reference to the Productivity Commission's so-called list of things to do. Um, they actually didn't have the list set out in, in that form at that time, but Gary Banks helpfully sometime later did uh, give a speech, a very good speech, where he set out various lists. It's a substantial one. The good thing about it being substantial is it says that there's a lot of things we can do over time to foster the improvement in living standards we all seek, and that's critical, of course, given that the terms of trade are no longer rising, so that source of growth in living standards is now passed. Well, to conclude, we, we have, I'm afraid, continued to live in interesting times. Many quite big challenges have been faced over recent years, but significant ones lie ahead. I don't think anybody can pretend that these will, will, things will be simple or easy, but prudent policies within the right frameworks and coupled with private initiative that responds to the right signals can, if we're prepared to accept those requirements, provide us with reasons for confidence about our future. Thank you very much for your attention. So um, uh, what we'll do now is uh, I'll open with the, the kind of uh, question that uh, uh, only economists can understand. Um, um, but uh, hopefully you've been working on your uh, questions while the, um, the, the governor has been talking to you. Uh, so there will be microphones going around uh, for people to come up and... Uh, uh, and ask questions of the governor. Um, my question, uh, my first question is really, have the rules changed um, to making monetary policy in, in the period since the global financial crisis? Time was that there was a guy called John Taylor who invented a thing called the Taylor Rule, which yeah. was a kind of a rough approximation of yeah. how central banks uh, made monetary policy uh, based on GDP and potential GDP and inflation. Mm. But I went to a presentation by him um, early in the year and he said uh, the world isn't working according to his rules anymore. Mm. Uh, but interest rates are much, much lower around the world than his rules would su suggest. Mm. And uh, there was a similar speech uh, by Janet Yellen, who has been Bernanke's deputy in April, which said the same thing, that... Uh, the famous uh, Taylor Rule produced interest rates which were much higher than she thought were appropriate and she thought that interest rates would be lower than that and for, for longer. Mm. Um, so why are we in this world where interest rates are, are much lower than in the normal rules? Is it because uh, investors are scared and holding money aside in case the worst happens, which means they've got less... <laughs> Uh, available for investment, so you have to make interest rates lower. I, is that the reason or is there a, another reason? Well, I think it's correct to say, as you do, that um, 
certainly for the US, the Taylor rule would have, um, actually it goes back a bit further, the Taylor rule would have had higher rates in the pre-crisis period than they did have. And uh, it's probably calling for somewhat higher rates than the US has right now. <coughs> um, I suspect in our case, uh, from my last time I looked at Taylor rules that we computed various kinds, we're probably not that far away from where such a rule would suggest we should be. But then we're still not running normal monetary policy. We're still trying to operate a world where interest rates are positive, they're low admittedly, but they're positive, they go up and down and other than for a very short period in 2009 we haven't had to resort to balance sheet measures in the way the other central banks have. But I think the rules have changed um, <coughs> for some of the other countries and um, really that was unavoidable because of the, the uh, situation they've faced. They whether or not um, uh, John Taylor's rule quite describes their behaviour, I guess we could debate, but at least from their own point of view, they got to zero on the rates and they felt that they needed still more stimulus from there. And I think if you look at economic outcomes uh, in many of these major countries, you can see why they, they felt they needed that. Um, and so they've resorted to uh, popularly called QE. The, the various countries call it different things, but essentially balance sheet expansion. That's a very different thing. That is a, a very different set of rules for, um, for policy makers. And in some sense, they're feeling their way in the dark with that because there's no historical precedent for, for these kinds of measures. So they've had to be innovative. They've had to, uh, to kind of a little bit make it up as they've gone along and that's not a criticism, there just wasn't any alternative. So I think we are in a different world in those cases and of course right now, I think I've gone off, no? Uh, the thing people are focusing on is what will be the nature of the eventual exit by the Fed from that very unusual world and again there there's no history to go on really and uh, so you know it's quite uncertain that that's part of uh, what's roiled markets a little in the past few weeks. So the answer I think is at least in the major countries there, there are some, some new rules in place unavoidably because of the position they've been in. In this country uh, I would say we're still operating to the same rules we have for 20 years so long may that be so. Are there questions from the audience? <coughs> Julian Pearce. I did not anticipate uh, the nature of challenges, no. I think I had a general sense that things had been pretty good and probably couldn't be quite as good in the future, but um, yes, things were quiet for a few months and then it all changed. Um, <laughs> I'm still hoping for them to get quiet again. Uh, what, are, what are the key lessons? I think, um, well, looking globally, you know, I think everybody's been shocked really, I shouldn't say everybody, the, the conventional wisdom was shocked by how fragile the global financial system turned out to be because of the complexity of the interlinkages and in the end the basically the thin capital uh, buffers that uh, the very large global banks had. That, and so a lesson that's been drawn there is we have to, in some sense, try to rebuild all those structures and hence the very 
very, very large global regulatory push that's been on for some years. Uh, we could debate how effective that'll be, but that's, that's the aim. Um, I think um, the other thing I'd say, I suppose, is um, uh, once the case for something to be done is starting to emerge reasonably clearly, it's best to act decisively and early. Um, I can't think of occasions where that's been the response that, that I've regretted it, whereas I think it's, um, I can think of I can think of episodes where, where, where a bit of delay, probably in hindsight, um, I might regret, but um, there are two things I'd say. Um, I'm careful what you sign up for, I suppose, is <laughs> another one. Next question over on the left. Hi. Um, with the, the US, you, you mentioned that there's a lot of talk about the taper. I, I guess if, if things work over there, I'd, I'd suggest that what's happened there is they've sort of tried to put a, a bit of a fire under the economy and there's two potential paths here. Either that fire can take, there's been some kindling and that can take off. Or, as we've seen, unfortunately, with other episodes of QE, if they take the pot off the fire, it could, could cool down. Mm. So I guess I, I would suggest that there's not an immaterial chance of the second thing happening. I don't know if it's 10% or 30%. But if that were to happen, what sort of measures are left or, or does that actually mean that you know, that approach to monetary policy has failed? Well, um, it's a good question. It's worth recounting that the Fed's had a few asset purchase programs. This is the one they're on now is the third or fourth. The others ended without particular drama, I think. That's the first point. So it's not to be assumed that uh, tapering, as, it, as the jargon has it, will necessarily be disastrous. Secondly, I think if you look at what the Fed said, uh, it's quite conditional. So what Ben said, actually what he said was what he'd already said a couple of times before. People were just paying more attention now, maybe. But he said, if things work out as, as in our forecast, then we will be able to start to slow down the rate of purchases, which still has their balance sheet expanding. So in a, in a genuine sense, they're still easing, just not quite as quickly, and then ending them in 14. And I think it's pretty clear they're thinking that the funds rate wouldn't rise till sometime in 2015, which is quite a long time away. But if things don't work out um, consistent with that outlook, then they won't do it. And I think, um, which is why I would say there is some chance, as you say, that it could all go wrong. That, that's always true. And that, that's obviously something they have to consider. But if it turns out that the Fed feels that the US economy is mending enough that they can very slowly start to step back from what are still extraordinary things, that's actually good news in itself. So I would actually hope that can happen. Um, it, it will, whenever the Fed changes course, there's inevitably some ructions. That, that's always true. It'll be true this time. But I think the world can cope with that, uh, provided that um, not too many silly things have been done in, 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 the, in the easy money period. That's always a risk. But the world can cope with that if it's happening because the, Fed, the, the US economy is actually on a better path. That, that's actually a good outcome. That's the outcome I think we should hope to see. Uh, Ross Elliott. 
Well, I think, I'm not sure I'd agree that we, I don't think we only have rising prices. We do have that um, countrywide, the, the rising gently, not falling. I actually think that's probably part of the scenario you need to have in order for the builders to be encouraged enough to build. People are not going to be that keen on building inventory whose value is falling every day. Um, I don't think that's a serious problem on a you know nationwide basis at the moment. There are no doubt pockets where it's quite hot, but um, uh, so house prices are, are gently rising, not falling. I don't think I'd agree that we don't have any pickup in construction. We do have some. It's probably a little slower than I thought, maybe, but um, I think the indicators are trending the right way there. But the broad question you ask, it's a good one, and I, I can remember saying three or four years ago, if all we get from cheap or lower interest rates is higher house prices and not more houses, that's actually not a very good outcome. I still believe that. I don't think we're going to get that here, but obviously that's a, a thing that we, we try to keep an eye on. and. Um, in the rate decision, of course, we have to calibrate to the extent we can how much shove we've given to um, various asset markets, including that one, which is quite an important one. So um, I guess that's, you know, I, I think things will probably work out okay, but it is a thing to watch very carefully for sure. Okay. Um, that's the end of the, uh, the time we had allotted for questions. Um, so I'd now like to ask uh, Brian Sheehan uh, to propose a vote of thanks to the Governor. Thanks very much, Michael. I might move this up. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I thank you uh, for attending the important lunch today. Uh, RBS Morgans is a proud sponsor of this event. And on behalf of my colleagues, uh, our fellow sponsors, PwC and supporter of Pincia and the Economic Society of Australia, I'd like to thank Mr Stevens very much for his informative address. Uh, today the Governor has given us some rare insights into the Australian economy and in particular how it is being influenced by both domestic and international issues. Clearly these insights are, are highly valued by the business community and this is reflected by the excellent attendance at today's lunch, so thanks all of you for coming. As someone uh, who has lived and worked in China in an earlier career, I particularly appreciate that the Reserve Bank in recent bulletins um, has published an upgraded independent analysis of Australia's linkages into China and provided a refreshing alternative to what has generally been American-focused research into the Middle Kingdom. For Australian business, this anal analysis is of significant value. China's relevance to our economy is growing, not only in areas such as resources and agriculture, but increasingly in other area, sectors such as tourism. And I think some of the charts in the recent bulletin uh, are a very interesting to look at if you haven't seen them. The RBA's research will hopefully enable better educated and more strategic decision making by business and government, and certainly from our firm's point of view, a more informed reaction by financial markets to the evolving economic development of the region. There's been a lot of overly knee-jerk reaction to some of the figures that are released, I think, internationally. Uh, certainly, um, uh, certainly, RBS Morgans is appreciative, appreciative of this work in enabling us to provide better advisory services to a wide array of clients across Australia through our network of 500 professional advisors. And obviously our Newcastle team does not need to rely only on, uh, on uh, spiritual guidance to get us <laughs> good advice going. We'd like to express also our thanks to the Economic Society of Australia who has facilitated this occasion. And we would like to thank the Economic Society for this invitation to participate as a lead sponsor. I will say that uh, next year, hopefully, when we're, if we're sponsor again, we might be missing the RBS name to the uh, Morgan's name because, uh, as you probably read, that we, uh, that, uh, the Morgan's people have bought out RBS from the uh, from the business and uh, now 100% owned as a Queensland business and entered into a strategic alliance with CIMB from Asia. So that's that will be uh, all unfolding in due course. Um, I think Mr Stevens first presented to us some two years ago uh, and following that, that presentation we received very much positive feedback and we requested he make this lunch a regular feature. Given his commitments, we are delighted and privileged he's returned and on behalf of all here today, we would sincerely like, him to thank, like to thank him for his time and efforts in addressing this lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, Glenn Stevens.